So, Dennis? Thank you, Kenny. For uh, those of you that are interested, I don't think I can do my talk in five minutes, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, wrong button. Okay. So when I was starting to put this talk together, I mean, what I like to do uh, myself is I'm trying to get my computer to talk to my radio, talk to other interface devices, and to map. Those are the three primary things I do. And as I put this talk together, I kept noticing that any one of these subjects could turn into a one-hour talk. So um, I'm going to focus primarily on mapping, and then at the very end, uh, we'll get a little bit into a hardware interface through serial ports on the thing. Um, Microsoft has done a lot of work in .NET. Um, one of the advantages of the old DOS systems was you could go in and get a hold of the hardware, and you could control the hardware. And when NT kind of came along, getting a hold of the hardware was like, uh, no, you can't. All right, you have to write a driver and stuff like that. What they've done in the .NET framework is they've started to recognize that you do need to get a control of that hardware every once in a while to do things with it. So they've started to provide some really nice, clean APIs that allow you to control your hardware and to do some things like that. Along with that, a lot of the applications now are structured in such a way that you can incorporate the applications through an ActiveX control right into a window and allow you to drive it. So I'm going to focus again on mapping functions, but we will get into GPS towards the end. See if the button works. OK, so the key things I'm going to talk about today uh, is map point and live maps. Uh, no Google Maps, sorry. I, uh, there's something in my contract that says I can't do that. Um, we will talk about a GPS device. I will be using C Sharp and .NET, sorry, no Linux. Uh, there is a product called Mono that's out there on Linux. Unfortunately, it's on the dot, uh, the 1.0.NET framework, and it doesn't have the serial interface uh, APIs yet, but everything else would work just fine uh, on that. So let's talk about mapping real quick. Basically, there's a series of things we want to be able to do. We want to find some things, places, address, find something that's nearby, okay, like a coffee shop. That was very important this morning. Where was the coffee shop, right? Um, we also want to take and be able to render things. We want to be able to take and change the map style. One of the advantages of live maps is you can get a bird's eye view. We can actually look at rooftop views and stuff like that. We want to be able to do routes. And the other thing is, is we want to be able to take and use layers to put data on the map, OK? Um, we're not going to talk too much about this stuff on this side. I am going to talk about the stuff on the other side. Uh, the reason for that is I don't have two hours, I only have one. So let's talk about our first application. It's going to be, a, uh, I'm going to do this in both map point and live maps. It's really simple. I just want to display a map, show the longitude and latitude of the center of the map. I want to be able to pan and zoom, and then I want to be able to add a push pin to the center. Somebody wants to talk to me. Um, before I get started, one of the problems with Windows, other than that you don't have a Linux, and Linux is a console program uh, system. When you get into Windows, there's a whole bunch of things in Windows that you create, and there's all this code that suddenly just spews forth just to do basic things. So I constructed this basic form, and the reality of it is, is that from the basic form, I can easily create either a map point or go connect to a web controller and do a live map control on the thing and not do anything else to the program. Everything else stays the same. So there's a big advantage to that. A um, few things on the controls for map point, how to set them up. And Kenny wanted to know how come I had 50, 60 slides. At the back of the deck are some actual screenshots of setting up this stuff um, that I put in this reference. But basically, we're going to just add a reference to either map point or we're going to add a web control. Once we do that, um, we're going to take and add the actual uh, control to the web to the page on the thing, and then we're going to add the create to the form, and then we're going to initialize the control. That's pretty much all you have to do. Um, in the case of live maps, we put a web control on, and then what we have to do is actually create the map web page, which is an HTML page. And there's some specific rules that we have to do for that. Um, and then we browse the document on a thing, and we invoke some scripts. 
A couple of functions that are really key here are these two. Um, HTML document.invoke script. If I use that call from Windows, it allows me to execute a script in the browser. And in the browser, if I call Windows uh, .external, whatever function, it allows me to execute the function in Windows from the browser. So that's how you can link the browser and Windows together uh, with the APIs. Button work. OK. Um, for those of you that don't know, Windows is an event-driven operating system. What that means is everything fires off an event. Nothing happens until the event occurs. Uh, for map point, there's a whole slug of events uh, that you go through. The primary ones we look for is before click. Okay, and this is where it gets confusing. Um, as a PM, I often will go shoot other PMs because of a bad naming nomenclature. What would you think before click meant? Before click. Okay? It's actually not before click. What it is is you've clicked the mouse, but map point hasn't rendered yet. So the click is all done, but map point hasn't rendered. So what you're doing is you're catching it just before map point actually goes and does something. Same thing with before double click. It's just before map point actually starts to do something, which is to draw the, the map itself. It allows you to intercept it and put something on. Those are used when you want to do panning operations and things like that. And I'll show you how those work. Uh, I think those are the only ones I really needed for map point was before click. Um, there's some other things around. For live maps, they have a similar set of events. All of these things are uh, on the live maps. Uh, you'll use more of the things on live maps. The big ones there are on in zoom and on, continu on in continuous span. Those basically on in continuous span is when the map has completed the drawing or the web is completed drawing the map. And then the on, on in zoom is when it's got through the zoom. The other thing that you'll want to use is um, the load map, on load map. Um, you want that one so that you can set up your system and sync the two together. And I'll show you how to do that as well. A um, couple of things you should know. This is cool stuff. Those of you that got map point 2006, you're going to say, oh, it's 2006 is already way out of date. Nice thing. Map point and streets and tips do the same data. OK? Map point costs around $200 retail. Streets and tips cost about $20 retail. So to update your map point, all you have to do is go out and buy the latest copy of Streets and Tips and load the data. Done. OK? Uh, nice little trick. The other key thing on our map point on that is to change your, when you change your altitude, you're changing your zoom of your picture. OK? Unlike uh, live maps, when you're zooming in and out of the picture, you're not really changing your altitude, your position on altitude. In map point, the way you, you zoom in and out is to change your altitude. Um, that kind of makes sense. You know, if you flew higher, you look down, you see more, right? Um, let's see, you got zoom effect pan. Map point uses a com interface, so you have to start it and stop it. That's a key thing, too. Again, the before click, before double click events are important. For live maps, um, Latest version is 6.0. There was a major change between 4.0 and 5.0. And it breaks. 4.0 maps don't work in 5.0, and, and there's a, um, it's a lot of problems. Uh, you can get a lot more info. I gave a slide there on that. The biggest thing I found is between IE6 and IE7 um, when doing it. On IE6, you need to take and use this HTML, XMS, uh, X, XML, NS, HTTP, whatever. Um, you don't need that on 7.0, and all the examples they give you are written for 7.0, of course. So you can't figure out why your maps don't work. Well, that's why. You put that in, they'll suddenly start working just fine. And of course, to find that piece of information out, you had to go back to map to 4.0 to figure that out. Uh, the body contains the maps, and the events are linked to the script through this VE attach event function. And I'll show you those. 
Okay, for panning and zooming, those are your panning and zooming functions. You can read those. Ah, on panning, to get panning to work for map points smoothly, uh, it turns out that there's this magic formula. Take your altitude and multiply it by this magic number, which just happens to be the eccentricity of the Earth or the curvature of the Earth. Uh, on a thing, and as you zoom out, what will happen is your zoom distance will be constant now, and it will actually look smoothly. The problem that you run into is if you're zoomed in at, at a mile or one mile up, and you zoom, you're moving at about two tenths of a mile. When you're up 200 miles, and you zoom on map point, and you move a, a unit of one, what happens is is you move about 200 miles. Okay a lot of distance changes. So by changing this, it'll move it and keep it pretty constant through there. Smooths out the map quite a little bit. Um, there was a lot of discussion on that. Uh, let me think. Uh, let's see. Other big changes on panning. Virtual Earth maps use x, y as pixels, and map point on the thing using a direction and a distance, essentially, or a panning factor. And that's why you want to use this this multiplier. And let's see. Yeah, adding the browser document, external methods. So that's pretty much there. And I can show you all of those. Okay, the demo. I thought that'd be fast. Wake up. Okay, so the first one is a simple map point demo. I brought up, and like I said, what we were trying to do was just give you the longitude and latitude, what your zoom factor was on that. I added a little control in there, which is my uh, two buttons on the thing, so I can have two displays, one's decimal degrees, and if I click on that, I can change the display so it's hours, uh, it's degrees, minutes, seconds. Um, ever had that painful problem of trying to convert those things? Okay. Um, the key things, again, to zoom, this is the on-click function. Basically, as I click the mouse, what it's doing is it's recording where I'm clicking and centering the map on that position. Okay. That's the same thing as this little pan control over here. And this, you can see the pan control is, uh, uh, I'm moving it. And then again, I have a zoom in, zoom out capability. Um, on that. And then at any point in time, if I wanted to, I could add a push pin to the middle of the map. And if I can see my, my mouse. Okay. And basically, I just put a push pin right here, wherever that is. Okay. And that just happens to be at that longitude and latitude. Uh, so that's a pretty simple application. For live maps, it's the same cow. Well, now I have to find the secret X key. And of course, now my PC is not going to work. For live maps, same problem. OK. Again, the difference between these, remember I was looking at a number like 200, 300. Here you're looking at a zoom of 14. The smaller the number, the higher up you are. The bigger the number, the slower you're, the closer you are to the ground. The zoom factor has to be between 1 and 19. But it has the same functions, works the same way. Mouse clicks. Um, will move you around, around the map just like the other system so I could center of the map here, well, or move the map, grab the map and move it around. And then drive it around like that. Okay? So that's just the basic function. Um, let's take a quick look at how I did that. So looking at the code for map point, um, I need to start point. So basically what I did is I created the aftergas control here. I first found out if it was null. If it was null, I went ahead and started it up just by creating a new one. And I gave it a center. 
okay, or, or located a center on the thing. I forgot the center, and I basically stored the center in a class that I created on the thing, and then I just updated my labels with longitude and latitude and zoom factor. Um, on the close, I have to make sure I stop it. So I look at app and I say, if app is null, it's not null, then I need to take close it down. And basically, I just say, well, save it and quit. There's a bunch of other things that happen, but Windows does all that. So, And let's see, locate the center. Uh, map point has this magic function. It's called xy to location. Basically, it takes a pixel and puts it into longitude and latitude. So I take the center of the screen, which is 1 half the width times the and one half the height, it goes to zero reference. And I just drop it in, and it gives me longitude and latitude. And that's all I did to calculate longitude and latitude, then I just update the position on the slide. Okay. For live maps, here's the HTML you have to have to start. So basically you have this at the beginning, you have this at the end, and you put all your functions in the middle and you're done. Okay. And to get started, this is the script. Now this is an HTML. This is actual JavaScript. Inside of JavaScript, this is what I do to get it started. And here's the events that I'm going to look at. And here's the functions I want called inside of the JavaScript when it happens. And then here's that magic command. Remember I told you when I wanted to execute something in Windows? Windows external script load complete. This is telling my C-sharp code I'm done. And what that does is it now goes and updates the labels uh, up on the top of where longitude and latitude is. Um, to go the other way, here's all the functions that are inside of my um, HTML. And basically what I do is I have this one thing called execute script in my C sharp code. And basically I give it the script name, which is one of these variables, and whatever parameters I want to stuff into it. And it calls that virtual earth map browser. That's the browser window document invoke script and then passes the information and it goes off and runs it. So if I want to call a, a script function, I use this. If I want to call a C-sharp function, I use the other one. Finding things. Any questions before I go into finding? I know I'm from going real fast. So you can map the GPS code. And I, this is what I'm going to show you here. I'm actually going to map. Um, I have a bunch of addresses. I'm going to map a bunch of addresses for you. Um, APRS point, those of you that know it, most people complain how slow it is. It's not map point that's slow. It's APRS, the, the code he wrote. Uh, because I'm going to map about 300 places on a map very quickly. It doesn't take very long at all. But yeah, I could draw it on the map, on map point, or I could draw it on the net. Um, I use this. My car signals where I'm at through APRS. At home, it picks it up and throws it up on the network. And then any time my wife can bring up a browser and tell, see where my car is. OK, that's dangerous. Because um, <laughs> uh, she knows that I'm on my way home. Oh, but I'm close to the store, so she can call me real quick. Actually, I, have a, I bought a, a data radio that I run to, to, for the APRS. That's dedicated to the APRS. Uh, I'm like Scott, I have the D700 in there, but I wanted both channels, so I've just got a data radio that's hooked onto the APRS, and that's it. And it fills the GPS up. And then I just put this up on the map, and my, like I said, my wife can look at a website and see where I'm at. Um, an address, finding something that's nearby. They have kind of a generic function called find result, where it can find an address or a place. And then you can find a push pin, which is a special case. Live map said, eh, it's just fine. What, where, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, biggest thing is live maps uses this concept called a callback to call back the interface on the thing. And the callback is executed after you've resolved the address. And they pass in five parameters that you have to deal with for the callback. Where map point is synchronous, you make the call, and it won't come back until it's done. Live maps will make the call. You'll come back, and then you have to wait for the callback to execute before you actually get the results. Uh, so you got to find geocoding, find that might find returns result object all. 
Uh, the ge geocoder rocks you use to get center. That's one way of doing it. Then you can do a callback shape layer, find result places, and more. So this is the second one. This is going to take me a little longer to set up. I apologize for that. Um, can't see my top lines, which is a problem here. Here we go. Now all we have to do is have this work. Yeah, it's coming up. Sorry, Windows has to come up slow. Okay, this is the same kind of application before, but the difference is, is that now instead of a single point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load a file of points on the thing. And this is an address file of 289 um, addresses. And when it gets all done, it should reset the map. I'll let it go as we talk. But basically, every time you see that thing blinking, it's loading another place in, finding it, putting it on the map, and actually putting a pin in the map for that. Um, and as you can see, it's going pretty quick. And there it is. OK? So a whole bunch of people I know that live in this area of the state just got mapped in. And I can look at their names and everything else like that. When you expand into that area, what you'll see is the pins will start to show up. Uh, for the individuals, and you can actually go and look at a single pen. Just like up here in Arlington, Shane Hill, see him sitting up there all by himself in, in Arlington? That's what a pen would look like. But because of the map is zoomed out to get everybody in, um, we put it in. So it didn't take that long to map about 289 places. Those are addresses, longitude and latitude map even faster. You can use the longitude and latitude off of your APRS net or a GPS device. Um, I'm not going to show you the live map. It does the same thing. Just a little fancier pins. What I am going to show you is the next one. Um, OK, uh, okay. before I go to a GPS device, I'll talk about this real quick. So how can you use this for um, ham radio? Everybody heard of, of grid, the grid square in the maidenhead? Well, there you go, grid. So this location, 47.6038.4823, which is about the center of that map this way, Minus 122, 33, 82, 56, 84, turns out to be CN87TO. OK? That's where it's located on the grid. So if you're ever doing that contesting, you can actually map out and find all the little secret places where you get in the corner exactly. And then from that corner, you can actually get four squares with one transmission. <laughs> you know, for those contesting kind of people. Um, this one also has the ability of looking at things. So I can look for, for libraries in um, Woodenville, Washington. And click on find, and if I'm lucky, Closest match to Woodenville is Woodenville, King County, Washington. Try again if the closest match is incorrect. So what it's warning me here is the way I spelled it 
or put it in wasn't exactly right. But here's the location of all of the libraries in and around Woodenville, Washington. Okay. I could also put in coffee shops, hardware stores, fire stations. Repeaters aren't there yet, but repeaters are going to get there. Um, I've been trying to find the data to locate you know, what repeaters are where. But what you'd like to do is get kind of, if this is the coverage area, these are the repeaters I could see. Um, Well, you can actually get into a rooftop mode here. Um, see if I can do this here, if this computer is going to respond to me or not. Nope, it's not going to do it. Oh, there it is. So you can look at road, and I can look at a, an aerial view. And then I could zoom in on the aerial view. So I could actually zoom into desktops here if I wanted to. Um, and get right on top of one of these places. Okay, so I'm looking right straight down, and you know whatever the center was. Um, so you know you can get that kind of information. You could actually find. So one of the things that you can do, and and I had it in my car until my car got broken into, is by tracking where other people are and tracking their distance that I did travel over time. I was getting traffic, live traffic information, and I could take it and say, okay, what was the situation like in traffic, and then I can know where the bottlenecks were and try to figure out an alternate route. Um, not easy, but you could do that. Of course, you have to have the internet connected to your car 24 by 7, which is no big deal. You just, you know, we can do that, right? We're ham radio operators. We know how to do that stuff. Um, okay, let me go on real quick to GPS, and then I'll wrap it up and we'll call it good. Um, key thing on GPS is that you need to go through the um, a serial device and Dot .NET came up with this really great concept of a serial port uh, device. It's actually a, a good model of a serial port. And you actually have everything you need to control the serial port. You can actually control the, um, the, the uh, DTR, RTS. Uh, you can change the carry, you can take, detect carry detect changes or changes in any of the lines or pins. You can also take and uh, buffer the data and so forth. And they basically drive it through a single they have they set these things all up and they drive it all through events and they have a set of events defined. The primary event that you want to look at is data receive, um, which basically when it gets called, whenever there's data available to be read. Okay? And again it's event driven. For GPS, the key thing there is it's just a serial port. So what I did is I created a model called a GPS device and it inherits from a serial port. And what I did is I set up the basic parameters for a GPS device. The nice thing about this is the serial port is USB savvy. Okay? So it doesn't care if you don't have any serial ports physically on your machine. If you have a USB device that acts like a serial port, it'll find it. Okay? So if we run this, Um, I'll blow this up. Basically, what the application does is it allows me to select a port, and from the drop down, you can see I have COM1, 3, and 7 on this machine. At home, I have a bunch of COM A, COM B, uh, because I have one of those um, uh, COM MUXs that allow you to, to, to share serial ports. And I also have like COM15, COM16, and so forth. So it'll find all the COM ports on your machine and make them available to you to connect to. It's up to you to know which one is the magic one for the USB device, and you can connect. And as you can see, I'm not getting any data, so it's kind of timing out. So that's probably not the right one. Um, see if it's that one. Or it could be, I am getting good data. Don't, I was getting good data, but unfortunately, GPS doesn't work inside the building. Um, so it did find it. But that's basically a COM device. And the serial device is pretty complicated, but it's very well documented. And they've come out with other devices as well. They now have this same serial device also understands Bluetooth serial ports. And so one of the things that you can do is you can go out and get a Bluetooth RS-232 device, plug it on the back of your radio, and then you can use that without having any wires between you and your radio to control your radio. 
um, get those wires off the table. And again, the serial port device understands how to do that. They also have devices out now for um, audio chains, uh, for audio, and they also have um, uh, some really good TCP IP uh, connection devices. Any questions? I kind of rushed through everything. Yes? So the basic thing that hook up the map, um, this is a live map. So you have this. What I do on this, it has to render this thing through so it's OK. So if I look at this display right in here, what I did is I added in here what's called a web browser control. OK? And I just dropped it into my form. If it was a map active, uh, if it was a map point, I would put a map point control and drop it into my form. That's all I do. And now you have the, the map point or you have a, uh, the web browser. With a web browser, that's a true web browser and you can do anything. I just happen to choose to put live map into the web browser and that's what I define with the HTML page. And that's done through this file right here is what gets added to add the, the map into the page. Okay? But that's all you do. It's pretty straightforward. It's really very easy to add a map to it. Okay? Any other questions? Um, the software, the slides will be up. There's a whole bunch of information on the slides of places to go and things to look at and so forth. Um, that's in the deck. And the software will be made available. It's not there yet. Uh, it probably has to be a couple of weeks uh, before we're d uh, I can put it up. Um, going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. The repeater book has attitude. Well, the repeater book has a location, and you can figure out Latin long from the location, nearby location. And if you use um, travel soft, the software that ARL sells, you can get longitude and latitude close enough. It's not exact. It's not an exact repeater location. And then you just have to enter it in. Uh, there is a website that has about 50% of the repeaters, uh, and it has longitude and latitude on that website. And so you can pull that down and actually get that. What you don't have is does this the area of coverage of that repeater. OK, and that's really what you want. What you want to know is, from my position, am I in this area of coverage to this repeater? And they don't have that up there yet. Uh, that's the next step. Yes? So the area of coverage does, uh, you something Correct. But the thing about radio mobile is you need to have longe and lat to get yourself in. So okay. this gets you your longe and lats, and you start from there, and then you can go back to radio mobile and get range of coverage. The nice thing about both of these, Live Point and Map Point, is there's a, a tool that Microsoft makes for free uh, called Map Cruncher. And what it does is it, it allows you to take this image and put it on top of this image. All you need to have is three points of reference. Okay, so you can take a radio mobile map and crunch it right on top of this map of where your location is. Um, the problem with that is it's trying to calculate radio mobile in real time. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. It's called Map Cruncher, yeah. It's a free software package that Microsoft has developed. It's, you'll t they talk about it a little bit. I have a, uh, some input on the slides on that. Yes? Out of your application, yes. Yep. Thank you for bringing that up. I hadn't mentioned that. Anything else? I didn't do too bad. It's uh, 5.30. I was supposed to start at 4.30. I kind of zipped through a bunch of things that, that I figured you could read as good as I can. So. so thank you, Dennis. I have...